On the night of November 16, 2005, Australia changed. Maybe forever. If ever a sporting event can be said to have altered the way a country sees itself, after 32 years of failure, Australia's qualification for the 2006 World Cup did just that. In Sydney, before 80,000 people, many millions more watching on TV across the country and around the world, John Aloisi scored a goal that made history. Here's Aloisi for a place in the World Cup. Aloisi, growing up in the suburbs of Adelaide, had long dreamed of scoring a goal that changed people's lives. But along with every other member of the Australian team that night, and many, many other Australian players across the years, Australia's newest sporting star had to leave his home and country to ensure that childhood dream came true. these young men leave their families, their friends, their homes. Like many kids across the world, no matter where they're from, from the streets of Montevideo or Melbourne, they're chasing a dream. A dream that means they leave behind the parks of suburban Australia to test themselves against the world's best. A dream to become the world's best. I knew as a, as a 15 year old, I knew 100% that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a professional footballer. Ever since I can remember, really, since about four years old, all I wanted to do is play football. My whole thing was about football. Yeah, my dream was to come to Italy. Come to Italy and play. Had a choice whether to continue uh, going to school or uh, take that big massive leap of uh, going to England and playing professional football. Um, I grew up in a football family. Um, always went to football with my dad. And, you know, he always told me, look, you know, watch your TV and it's something you could do one day if you really work hard. Australia loves sporting heroes. As a nation, we eulogise local athletes whose achievements take place in arenas no grander than suburban parks. On the global playing field, we love nothing more than to beat the world at their own game. Yet Australia's football heroes are made in Amsterdam, Milan and London rather than Sydney, Melbourne or Perth. The big English and European clubs can spend more money on one player than a single Australian club spends on its entire team. The reasons are both simple and complicated. Until Mark Bresciotto's goal, Mark Schwartz's saves, and John Aloisi's penalty, Australian football feats all occurred on foreign fields far from the eyes of Australia's public. In comparison to the riches in Europe, football's heartland, Australia offered little, if any, opportunity. January 14, 1958. A spirit of adventure has long driven Australians. Modern day Australia is founded on it. Australians are also nomads, stretching back to the country's original inhabitants. To survive, travel is a necessity. The away game is not just a dream, it's a way of life. In 1950, Joe Marston, a young man from the inner suburbs of Sydney, took off an adventure and four years later played in the FA Cup final, one of the most famous sporting events in the world. Professional football in Australia was unheard of at the time. The local league's biggest stars all had day jobs to consider. I worked at Oldfield's paint factory. I was what they call a hair draft. You know all the bristles that go into a brush? I blended all those together and, they, and you uh, made it up for the brush makers to make up. It was a five year apprenticeship. And I had a very good uh, boss, the old fellow. And uh, when I was getting picked with representative times and I had to go away, he gave me the time off. He didn't pay me, but he gave me the time off and I made it up when I come back. Joe Marston was a volunteer lifesaver at Sydney's Whale Beach when English club Preston North End came knocking. A scout had spotted Marston's football skill and tipped off Preston. 
there was talent on the other side of the world. Joe and wife Edith left Sydney on the first Friday night of February 1950. By Saturday, their plane, a Lockheed Constellation, had made it to Singapore. It took us four days. We stopped at the Raffles Hotel in Singapore and places like that. We had first class treatment all the while. It was 650 pounds to send us both over on a Constellation. You know, so that was very expensive. Got the propellers, no jets, propellers. <laughs> The first year Joe was there, his contract was £7 a week in the playing season and £6 in the off-season until he played five games in the first grade, then he would go up to the first grade wages, which were, I think, $12 or $14 a week. You trained every day for six weeks. You had the afternoon off. Joe Marston was the first Australian to play in an FA Cup final. 100,000 fans packed into London's famous Wembley Stadium. Joe Marston lined up to meet the Queen. I went over there in the first place to see if I could be a better footballer. And I proved I could. And that's all I wanted. If I wanted money, I would have stayed there, you know, the more. But I just wanted, I got, I got homesick. I wanted to come home. I proved what I wanted to do. And just before I came home, uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but they heard that Arsenal wanted to pay £80,000 for me. And uh, I, well, I said at the time, I said, well, I wouldn't have gone because I would have stayed with the club because they were so good to both of us. To make a move overseas, it's a, it's a very um, difficult um, decision when is the right time to go. I think it's, it's, a, it's a big move and you have to be mentally prepared as well as physically. I left Australia to go, go to Croatia, played in Croatia for all of three months, but uh, I was only young, I was only 16 years old, and the war just started. Um, it was probably not the right time to leave anyway, so I ended up coming back, back to Australia. They only spoke French there, so I was French-speaking part of Belgium, and I couldn't speak any French. Lived by myself, away from my family. Um, didn't see anyone, family, friends for six months, and I found it really hard. If you go to Asia or go to Japan first, um, they're just as professional as they are in Europe. And if you're playing week in, week out, you, you can learn. You can learn very quickly what it takes to be a professional, what it is to, to play at a high level and, and, and to play well in, in your ups and downs when you're not playing well. And um, that prepared me very well for Europe when I went to uh, Crystal Palace. You have to go abroad to stay at that, at that level that you want to be at, you know, because if, for instance, if I want to play for the first team at Stoke, if I was in Australia till I was 18, 19, I don't think that would be a possibility. Craig Johnston! Don't please no Johnston, yes! It would be more than 30 years after Joe Marston's adventure that any other Australian would have an impact on the world scene. Craig Johnston was a scrawny kid from the Australian beaches. His determination to succeed is unmatched in football history. Driven by a dream, at the age of 12, he had to overcome a disease that nearly claimed his leg. And I got kicked in my leg, and the leg got very badly infected, and I contracted poliomyelitis, which was a form of uh, polio um, way back then. So when it was diagnosed, I had this uh, dreadful disease. Uh, my mum and dad had to come into the hospital, and the, the uh, amputation orders were actually signed by my parents. Um, and as luck would have it, there was a, a doctor from America that was touring who was a specialist in this. He said, no, he said, um, we can save this leg. And he operated and saved the leg. Doctor said Johnson would never play football again. But even as a kid, impossible was a word Craig Johnson could not understand. To fund a trip to England, a chance to trial with Middlesbrough, Craig Johnson's parents sold their house. So they took one look at me and they, they, they were in fits of laughter because I was, I, was I was that bad. So the true test of this is we had a trial game and Jack Charlton, uh, who was the famous manager, he came to watch Middlesbrough youth play Leeds youth. So at half time, we're getting beat against Leeds. And he came in and he had a go at everybody in the dressing room. Then he pointed to me, he said, you, kangaroo, you know, wherever you're from, said, you are the worst footballer I have ever seen in my life. Now, now hop it back to Australia. So, I went back to the digs, packed my bag up, and then I, then I had to phone my parents, who are now living in a really small house out at Rathmines. 
Uh, and I got on the phone, you know, it was one of those old, old, old phones, and um, phoned Mum and she said, Craigus, Craigus, how was your big trial? How, how was Jack Charlton? Did, did he like it? What happened? And I said, well, Mum, I said, um, I said he, he absolutely loved me. He said so much so, he said he's, I'm one of the finest footballers he's ever seen and he wants me to stay. And I hung the phone up like that because I just couldn't say the words. I, I'd spent a year and a half practicing, volleying, heading, chipping in the car park, you know, hiding from Jack Charlton. And I drew a goal and I'd draw crosses on the wall in the goal and I would have to hit the five crosses in the five positions a hundred times, left foot and right foot, before I went home, you know, for supper. And if I didn't do it a hundred times, right, I was late for supper and I'd miss supper. So I concentrated on doing it. On the other side of the world, Johnston was more a novelty act. He was a circus freak. I, I woke up to that headline and I said, you're kidding. And it said that nine clubs, Tottenham, Arsenal, Nottingham Forest, where Cluffy was, Liverpool, are chasing the kangaroo. So all of a sudden, I was hot property. It's a goal for Liverpool! And uh, I was the most expensive player in Britain. Craig Johnston! You know, this is all in the, in the, the framework of three or four years. Against so many odds, John Marston and Craig Johnson showed Australians could make it. The door swung open. Dreams could come true. It's a great opportunity for myself. And, and when, you, when you have the likes of Koku and Reisiger that you're training with each day and uh, playing with on the weekend, I mean, it's just incredible. The attitude of the people as well, I think that was the main thing. I, I felt that. The Dutch people had a similar mentality to the Australians, and I think the Belgians were very cold and, uh, and negative. Uh, I learned a lot. I must say I learned a lot uh, character-wise, seeing what the big world of football is like. There's uh, not much loyalty shown. Uh, watch your own back. Dog-eat-dog -dog world, I suppose. And if you're, not, if you're not big enough and strong enough to, to hold your own, they'll eat, eat you alive. I came to Holland for a reason, and you know, and I've always wanted to become a, a football player, and by going home and and um, you know it's, it's sort of like giving up, and I didn't want to give up. I wanted to stay here and prove myself. You're only in it for a certain amount of time, but that certain amount of time, you know, you're away most of the time. I'd say, out of seven or eight months that you're in the season, a good three months you're away. Actually, here a long time ago was uh, was an old vineyard that uh, actually my wife's walking on top of now, and uh, it's actually her grandfather was a, was a wine grower. So this all this back area was uh, full of uh, full of grapes. That's Victoria up there. There's a bit of a tiger, and the other girl is Sophia, who. Uh, keeps me very busy. And obviously that's Barbara, my wife over there. This summer <laughs> there'll be a, a lot of barbecues on and uh, it'll be good to catch up with family, which I haven't seen for a while. I never liked school, which is not gonna be a nice thing to say for a lot of parents out there. I, I never really liked school. It was just not for me. It was just not for me probably can hear it in my English now. I didn't have really any other uh, passions. Destiny, I don't like to use it too much, but I think it, it would have tapped me sooner or later because I just, I would never have given up. You know, I, I am a lucky person. I am a lucky person. <laughs> my name is Vincenzo. Strange name for Aussie. <laughs> Very strange. Ho incontrato Vincenzo a Empoli e io lavoravo in, in un negozio di scarpe, shoes, shop. E Vincenzo comprava tante scarpe, <laughs> <laughs> too much. There's one of me, that's when I was flying. Favorite of Barbara's. My preferred. I'm gonna get that framed. Very nice. 
And then I got one, you probably won't recognise this guy, but his mum, his mum will. That's Mark Bresciano when he had hair, and he was about five or six years younger. We train against each other every day, and we're very competitive players. I wouldn't kick him on purpose, but if the ball was there, it's either mine or it's, it's yours, and uh, you know the way I am, and uh, I try and make it mine. Well, that's... It's a character. It's a character he has, and I think we all have. Um, we're all competitive. I mean, regardless of who we have to compete against. After the game is when you're friends. My real name is Mark, passport, birth certificate, but I'm actually named after my grandfather, which is Marco. But if you say it Marco, like in the Italian pronunciation is okay. I don't like Marco. I prefer Mark. So I'm difficult. <laughs> Moving here to Italy, I found it pretty hard the first year. I was actually prepared to go back home. Not only because the country or the culture shock, it's just the footballing wasn't going too well for me the first year. That's when I was thinking of packing everything in and going home. A lot of Italians live for their, for their soccer, their football. And you can get some cities here in Italy that are much more fanatic than others. And I think Italians are sore losers, mate, here in Italy. You lose a game. Oh, it's happened here and it's happened at Empoli too. Sometimes we waited up to two hours to get out of the, the change rooms because of the protesting of the fans. My first experience living in the city was at Empoli. Where my first apartment, I thought, you know, being alone and want to be close to all the shops and to the movement or whatever. And I'd probably live there a couple of months and that's when I realised that it was, it was too noisy. Too many cars going by at nights, the bars and everything. I couldn't sleep, couldn't rest. And from that year, I've never ever moved or lived into the city. With the language, I understood everything. Couldn't speak it. The reason why I understood is because my parents used to speak to me in Italian and obviously used to reply in English. In Australia, I'm an Italian and here I'm an, uh, I'm an Aussie. Vince probably was the one that started the roots there because he got there, I don't know if it was a year or six months before I arrived. So obviously him being there and already doing well, them getting to know the Aussie mentality helped probably help me get there too and help now all the Aussies there at Empoli. Well, I think the thing they like here in Italy is just how much we work, how much we put in. Well, my manager keeps saying it to me, don't lose your Aussie mentality because that's what they love. Train, eat, sleep, Monday. Train, eat, sleep, Tuesday. Train, eat, train, sleep, Wednesday. Train, eat, sleep, Thursday. Eat, train, <laughs> sleep. <laughs> train, eat, sleep. Stretching, match. Full. Don't have a day off. I look for days off in the calendar all the time. <laughs> and they just never seem to be there. My story is it's, it's a fairy tale story. I could score two, three goals in a game, but it's why didn't you score five? You know, you get in the back of a van and my mum will have the sandal off her foot and give me a slap on the back of the head, but that's the Samoan way of doing things. But my old man was pretty much calm and collective and having a giggle at the front. <laughs> my older brother and my younger brother, that they were obviously going to flourish as footballers as well, but it was just at the stage where it was my, it was, it was my turn and they, my, my mum and dad gave me the opportunity and uh, I was grateful, so it was, it was very easy for me to, to fly over by myself, to stay with uh, family from my mum's side and to, to sacrifice it because uh, <clears throat> they put a lot into it. And I wasn't earning loads of money. I think my first contract was £250 a week. 
and uh, digs paid and things like that. It was one of them scenarios where you had to do the graft, and I did the graft. Probably took me five years to get myself on the on, on the ladder properly. So, uh, and even still, then you forever every year have to prove. If you scored 10 goals last year, you have to score 10 goals again the next year. And finally turned in for Everton by Tim Cahill. Every week I play in front of 40, 40,000 people. They watch it in Australia. And just me scoring is like a, it's a big enough reward than, than sending a check home. Look. I've got two beautiful boys, a lovely girlfriend, and a, like brothers, sister, and, uh, and like a big, big family on my mum's side, especially, like, being Simone and that side. If you see some of the size of my cousins and my brothers, then uh, I, there's no way I can be able to get ahead of myself. So, you know, I go home and if we go to a bar, they buy me a drink, and I, I don't get a chance to buy them one. It's, it is a family house, you know. My, if someone's always coming in out, the neighbours, and I've, I've got a lot, lot of close friends as well. Next one fly. I can't even answer this question with a straight face. Uh, yeah, Lucas Neal, um, what more can I say about him? Definitely we always looked out for each other um, on the football pitch and off it. We're, you know, we're always together and uh, it's just one of them things. It's always easy when you've got a mate there. And as the years got on, we obviously uh, explored a bit more and went to museums and, and, and you know art shows and things like that and really enjoyed it. But, <laughs> Some beautiful art going around London at the time. I can't stitch him up, can I? Proper, can I? I'm more an impressionist, <laughs> to be honest. Um, Timmy liked his renaissance. I'll give him his fair due. He's a hard-working lad. He's um, very honest and, you know, he does work hard and when he wants something, he gets it. And I mean, not only football, everything. Women, everything. <laughs> In football, the mental side's bigger than probably the physical side. The biggest thing for me was my attitude, which which got me to where I am. So, you know, it, it's not all about coming here, scoring 50 goals and then uh, doing a couple of tricks. It's about playing every day and developing because if you develop as a footballer just a bit every day, then you're going to be a good footballer. Teased in towards McFadden and touched back and finished with a plum by Tim Cahill. It was a very, very big step uh, to go away from Australia. Two reasons was obviously the distance, but the, the first reason was the lack of respect that we had overseas as Australian footballers. Four years ago, a uh, final at Rotterdam won the UEFA Cup and one of the key players was Brad Hamilton. And, uh, he was a very important player for, for Feyenoord, just not, not just a player in the team, but a key player. And I think he was very important in the development of Australian football in, uh, in Holland. I think it was a different way. We come from so far away and they don't expect Australians to play in, in France, I guess. And Firstly, our attitude and the never say die kind of 100% commitment. And the fact that this is our once in a lifetime opportunity, we don't have these opportunities on our own back door, so we won't take them for granted. They're basically winners. They, they want to go as far as they can and, and be the best that they can be. And that's always been my philosophy since I've come to the club, that I've tried to build that uh, belief and philosophy into every one of the players here. And, and Brett and, and Lucas have that anyway. I like their, uh, their mental qualities because they never give up. They, they go for 90 minutes on, on high pace. When we are signing a, a foreign player, we have all the respect. It doesn't matter from which country is coming. No, no, we, you can't compare it or make any difference between it. Josip Skoko never played professional football in Australia. He packed his bags to chase a ball to Croatia, Belgium, Turkey, and now England's Premier League. Sometimes things don't always go to plan. If things aren't working out in one, one part of the world, then, then you just pack up and you go to another part and, you know, it might be that you don't know anything about this part of the world, which for me was, for example, Turkey, and nobody knows about you really. And um, your life can change overnight, basically. You know, you, you can be from someone who, who hasn't played a game in some other league to, to a superstar in a, in a different league.
Yeah, the fact that Steve Horvath and Mark Viduka were came across at the same time as me to ha well, Steve to Hayduk and Mark to Dinamo well, made it a lot easier. I mean, me and Mark have been good friends for even a while before that, and and um, just to be in the same country, to be living the same problems and that um, you know made it easier. So yeah, we definitely felt like we were Australians when we were there. I mean, we thought we knew the language, for example, but you know we had the piss taken out of us countless times, you know. When the Turkish league, it's a bit, a little bit different, I suppose. They're throwing things at you before, during, and after the game, from different fruits, apples, mobile phones, shoes, you know, all, all sorts of things. So, um, you know, you're happy when a lighter comes down. Uh, the English Premier League. Well, it's probably labelled the best league in the world. It's the most televised, and it's probably got the most stars in the world, and the salaries are probably the highest. So, take any, take a pick of any of those, and. Probably see why everyone wants to at least have a go, and that was for me, you know, somewhere where I wanted to see if I can, if I can do it, mix it with the best. In Turkey, there was plenty of sun, plenty of sun, but I could never use it because we were always in camps and at training all the day, you know, for for ages. So we didn't have that much free time. Here in England, it's very professional. You know, you do your work, train once a day, afternoons always off, but no sun. Yeah, it's very difficult with a young family. I mean, with one kid, it's it's hard, but with two, it's even harder, I think. This is his little Wigan strip. He doesn't go anywhere without his strips. Home, away, third strip of Wigan. He's got an Australian and the Croatian. Bit of a conflict there. But he's got a good shot on him. When you look at your whole career, your whole career is a little bit working towards this. Um, I've, I've been with the national team for nine or ten years, and you know everything you think about is getting to a World Cup, and all the failures that you've had in the past, and and you know all the other players as well, all together. It's just you know a crowning moment in your career, really. Well, uh, it happened with uh, a camp a while back uh, in England that I asked for some parmesan cheese, which we use regularly in Italy. And uh, they brought me a, a very poor equivalent of parmesan cheese. And I said, well, why can't I, uh, why can't I bring it from Italy? And, uh, cause it was absolutely, it was shocking. It was shocking. I've started off bringing uh, not a huge block of cheese. Didn't even last the first dinner. And we we're there for like a week, so. Every camp, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this time I actually brought two big ones. They loved it, because it disappeared. Young players, naive and inexperienced, for prey to agents, managers and advisors, all with promises to make, all offering shortcuts to the top. I'm an apprentice for Stoke, so I came over here in March on trial for three weeks and then got offered I put a two-year scholarship, so I've been over ever since. Uh, I live with a family in Stoke. Like they set me up with a family, and I live with a couple of the lads who play. Who I play with. You're really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> you train most days. Uh, on Tuesday and Thursday, you go to college, like and do schoolwork and that. And then you play on the Saturday. You have the Sunday off. Yo, that would be ideal, like to get a professional contract here and stay on as long as you can. But if it didn't, you know, sort of work out, that's when you've got to start looking for another club elsewhere and you don't know where you're going to go, you know. Look at people like Yossip and the life he's got and, you know, sort of the crowds he's playing in front of, playing in grounds like this, you know, and that's what keeps you going. So if you break through, you know, you could end up like that. In reality, nobody ever asks you how many, how many fans there are in the stadium or what colour the your clothes or they don't ask you also how many penas there are. Penas is organizations. Uh, they only ask one thing, how much? And the classification is a piece of meat or, or um, just a tool is probably fair really. Um, but I think in Europe or in professional football that you get compensated for it, you know. There's no jobs that you're going to get paid but players do get paid. Um, outside there, there's people working a lot harder than football players and not getting anywhere near the compensation we do. You know, in 85 we, we stayed in a two-star hotel and, and travelled economy class and 
everything was, you know, just done. You know, but now it's got to be business class flights, top class hotels, the training fields have to be perfect, you know, everything's got to be perfect. Even the clothes they wear, tracksuits and that have to be perfect. That's not the fact that they're, uh, they're prima donnas, but that's how they get treated week in or day in, day out at their clubs in Europe. In Alaves we would make about four times that much, we'll probably make about 400,000 Euro, euros, uh, average, average price or average salary that player makes. No, it's not a chicken feed. I know we do get paid, um, you know, um, some good money in that, but you've got to be smart with it. Um, there's a lot of players out there that may not be, you know, and they could, they, could, they could blow the money straight away and have nothing because it is a short period of your life where you can earn some good money, but that money don't last forever. You've got to, you know, it's got to last you for the rest of your life. Some money's important and you have to make it quickly. And, um, but, uh, you know, I just, like I said, when you, when you run out into a pitch and you've got so many people watching and you're screaming your name and uh, no amount of money can sort of pay for that. The TV money's obviously blown football out of all proportion really in terms of payments and, and things like that. So it's, um, it's big business, basically. Out of position, back out, deflects, what a save! I have a very fortunate life. It's hard whilst we're working, but it's not hard the rest of the time. But I suppose you have to take the reward for working hard is lots of free time. But I chose that path a number of years ago and I'm never gonna feel sorry for anyone else because I earn X amount of thousands of pounds for what I do and people say you're overpaid, but you're doing a job that you love and somebody's willing to give you that money, so you might as well take it. We all learnt to start going out when we were, you know, 15, 16, 17 to the house party down the road or whatever. I never used to go because I'd have soccer the next day and all my mates used to say, yeah, oh, it was a great party and loads of hot little girls there and all that and, it, and it's part of growing up but uh, you only get to do it once every ten times whereas they go out every weekend and you think you're missing out on something but all of a sudden you're in the glamour of the English Premier League and no disrespect to anybody that you know they're, they're British labour or they're doing a job that may be not, not their desired job and um, you soon learn that all those Friday nights in and that extra training and doing extra soccer schools or whatever it was, it's all paid off. I always had a deal when I went over for trials with QPR with my family that education was always important and the deal was if I did well I'd still have to come back to do the last three months of my school which is, it seems like an easy deal when you're going over but once you've been handed a contract and they want you to stay it's um, not as easy a decision to make but I, um, I held up my part of the deal, went back and finished my schooling and uh, got on the first plane over in November. I made the deadline and the next day Dad arrived in time to see his son play in the Premier League for the first time. It was amazing and I didn't feel out of depth at all and when I was running around on the field that was when I actually felt I've made it now, this is it and this is where I felt for so long I belong. This is a, this is a Vizsla. He's a hunting dog, he's a pointing hunting dog. And the Labrador is a retrieving dog, so he basically is man's best friend, always sits by his side, and then uh, when he's told, he runs out and fetches whatever you've shot and brings it back to your feet. Well, that's the idea. And um, hopefully, between the three of you, you make a good team. Oh, there we are. I basically live here because it's very peaceful. The fact that I can feel like the Lord is it's irrelevant, but yeah, it does make you feel very special. Yeah, Blackburn's not, we're only a small town, we're not a big city, and uh, our supporters will only ever be, you know, a hardcore of 15, 20,000, so it's not a very rich town. It's um, people who graft very hard for the money, and on their Saturday, they want to see a committed player and a committed team, and it makes them happy for the rest of the week. The population of 40,000 here is not much going down. It's 
pretty quiet. You see a lot, a lot, a lot of old people. I think it's more of a retirement village more than a place where young people would hang out. But um, in saying that, uh, football has made me come here and has made me appreciate other things in life. I must say, I've, I've come to like the place and my team's a great bunch of guys and, you know, I can't, I can't fault the place, really. It's beautiful and, and we've had great success with our club playing in the Champions League and the UEFA Cup, so I can't really complain. Playing in Australia is not comparable to playing in Europe. Every player will tell you that. And coming over here made me learn a lot about myself, change of the person, I'm constantly evolving. Lubo Milicevic had a dream, derailed by injuries playing for Australia. The tiny Swiss town of Thun is beautiful, but for Milicevic, once one of the most promising players Australia has produced, some things don't always go according to plan. First time I arrived overseas in Europe, I came from summer in Australia, so it was 35 degrees in Perth at the time, to minus 10 in Zurich. Fog everywhere, I couldn't see the sky, it was snowing, it was freezing, I didn't have the appropriate clothing. Getting injured playing for Australia was a bitch of a thing because I love playing for my country, but it seems like all I've had is bad luck wearing the green and gold, you know? And both times our major injury, both times kept me out of the game for my all up for over two and a half years, so it was really tough coming back from it, but you know, if Australia calls me tomorrow, I'll be back there again. Everyone thinks that football is this glamorous lifestyle where all you do is go shopping, go to A-list parties, sit in VIP sections, get free tickets to concerts and, you know, sign autographs all day. I mean, yeah, you do do that. <laughs> no, but um, the flip side is when you're injured, you're stuck out in the wilderness. Definitely very testing, very trying. And the last time was the worst, obviously, spending four months in Australia. It was hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And to be honest, I didn't think about football. I didn't care about football anymore. Um, I was that devastated. How you snap out of that, I don't know. It's something that comes from within. I can't explain it, but the last day before I had to come back to Switzerland, I, you know, the switch got flicked on again. And it was basically, the way I look at it is, I was put on earth to play football, you know, and up until the age of 35, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Before important games, you know, they'll, they'll bring out, you might be the last training, they'll bring out some sweets or something. They say, oh, this is tradition for good luck and things like this. They'd constantly, they were doing this. But at the start of a the season, they always had the traditional slaying of the, yeah, of the goat. And I mean, I didn't know what was going on. Someone told me, um, that they're doing the slang or whatever, I go, yeah, great, you know, good luck, good luck to them, they'll bring us luck and that. And then everyone started going outside because I didn't realise it was outside on the pitch, dig a hole and, and you know, so, um, you know, went to see what all the commotion's about and you see this guy with this, I don't know what he had in his hand, just blood going everywhere and sort of, um, yeah, half of it there, half of it there and in a sort of a little hole. It was right on the edge of the pitch, so it was like nothing I've ever seen before, like, You've made it, I think, when you're you're making a living out of the game. Yeah, because you're playing professional football, but you always have to remember that football can end tomorrow. You could be playing Premier League, Serie A or La Liga and only play six months and have a bad injury or get a coach that doesn't like you or get a club that doesn't want to play you anymore and you're stuck there for a while and then you don't end up recovering from that. So. Making it, making it is when you've had a, a long career and, and you retire at 33, 34 and say, oh, well, oh, I did it right out of the game. When I came back from trialling over in Belgium, uh, he worked at Adelaide City and he said to me, he goes, you won't, you won't last long over there. And, and I looked at him and I go, why? And he goes, because you're too, you're too family orientated. You're, you're from Italian parents. 
you won't last long over there. And and that drove me on even more. You know, that's uh, that made me think. Well, I'm going to prove not only him wrong, but I'm going to make myself a stronger person by you know showing him that it doesn't matter what I go through, that I'll I'll last you know a career over there. It is a job because it's not every morning that you want to wake up when it's it's snowing and and go out and train. And uh, even how much you love the, the sport and love everything, it would be a lot nicer to wake up in Adelaide and, uh, and go play when it's uh, 25 degrees and go training and be with your family. And... No, no. Look, you like this, you like this, look. You like this. No, no. To be fair, I've been lucky because um, Angela's very good. Like, uh, she, she understands my profession, she knows that uh, I like to sleep in the afternoon or I like to rest and uh, to be fair she actually loves the lifestyle over here and she's been brilliant for me and been very helpful and, and I haven't had that, that side to worry about so I've been, I've been very lucky. Cheers Katia. <laughs> because I started to think Football is not the most important thing in life. My kids are, and, uh, and my family is. And, and as soon as I had them, I, I, I started to realise and I started to relax a little bit more playing football because watching them grow up is is better than any game. You know, it's uh, it's better than scoring goals. It's better than, uh, or it, it's a lot better than having a bad game, of course. But uh, it, it takes your mind off of it. First, you finish this. There's one, two, three. There's three there. And just try and enjoy every day that you're able to train, able to play. And, and even if you, don't, you have a bad day, have a bad game, you know, be thankful that you're not injured or, or that you're still playing because uh, you don't know how long that's going to last for. Where do I meet my girlfriend? Uh, in the pub. Emma, my girlfriend, was the manager of my local in Coventry, in Stratford-upon-Avon. I think she got a little bit sick of sweeping me out the door at closing and took pity on me. So if you're ever chasing a woman, drink heavily. <laughs> it works a treat. <laughs> when I get to about 40, i say my body would be, I think I'm going to have a nice big stomach, just so I can put the beer on there. I just have a nice relaxing time at the end of my career because I think I deserve it. Have you seen Wolf Creek? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> well then. And ask, me if you, ask me if you want to pack the kids up and go around Australia then. Um, bangers and mash. Fish and chips. What else? I've done, I can't make my own Yorkshire pudding, so I've never tried actually. We just cheat and get them out of the packet. And... My mum's cooking is what got me strong. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't eat too much. No, it's cold. Yeah, yeah it's cold because you had too much. She's always asked and said to me, um, you know, if if, uh, if I was going into labour and it was a day of a World Cup final, would you go to the final or would you, you know, and. Because we didn't have kids at the time, I would say oh, I'd have to go to the World Cup final, you know. <laughs> but uh, obviously now having a child, and um, if she had, if she asked me that same question, I'd say I'd stay with your baby, hundred percent. Excellent. Mm. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I used to be good at doing scissor kicks. I used to be bad, not not too bad up front. But the problem is you got to run. You got to run. That's not my game. That's not my game running. I think uh, after seeing Peter Crouch, he's doing so well now for Liverpool. Yeah, maybe I could, could finish my career as a striker, playing with the boys for the pub team. The stubby glove, that's the way to do it, mate. Outdoors, keeps your hand warm and your beer cold. <laughs> How good's that? It's massive. I mean, you know, for Qantas to put on a, a plane like that for us, 
uh, with the ability to actually have massage tables on the plane was, was fantastic. It gave us the ideal opportunity to, to recuperate as, as best as possible for such a long trip back home. You know, we were one plane, we stopped off only once, and um, you know, we were basically able to dictate what happened on the plane in the sense of when we ate, when we slept, and we were able to get treated. Playing two matches within three days is very difficult with a 22-hour flight in between. Uh, the charter flight turned that flight into a pleasant experience rather than uh, something that was going to be draining on the, on the players and made a huge difference when we went into extra time in the match in Sydney. I, uh, I'm getting goosebumps now because uh, it just meant everything. You know, 20 years, 20 years of my life that went into four failed campaigns as a player. Everyone talks about in Australian sporting history as one of the worst moments, I think, was Iran. Everyone talks about, oh, you know, I remember that night, Australia, how did you just lose that? And you, you know, you put your head down because you, you were embarrassed by it. And now, you know, you look at what happened where people say that it was one of the greatest sporting nights in the history of Australian sport. Um, and it was an unbelievable night. You know, I think the, you couldn't have scripted it better. When we got to the penalty shootouts, everyone was saying, I knew, well, we knew everyone was saying, so close yet so far away, is this going to be our time to, 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 to do it? But even before the game, we knew this was it. This is where it's come to, you know, it's, it's down to now each individual's nerve and, and um, you know, I felt very confident. What is the true meaning of this penalty shootout? The penalty shootout is to not only win the game, but to qualify for the largest tournament on the planet. And supposedly they had a divine right to do so. So, you know, if anything, they've got a lot more pressure than us because they're expected to get through. We're not, we're expected to fail the game like every other time. Imagine playing in a crowd like that every week, supporting you. But obviously, for a player, I think it's more emotional as well, playing for your country. So I meant a lot more of 80,000 Australians than 80,000 Parmigiani. Because obviously it's where you come from, it's where you've been brought up, where you're born. So it was a lot more emotional for us. And they were our 12th man. This is the the penalty that's going to take us straight to the World Cup. Just do it, you know, just line up the way you've been lining up in training, because I measured my run up and I knew where I was, had to hit the ball and and uh, so I had no problems at all. I was, I was confident, you know, that at that time and I wasn't thinking about the 20 million Australians or the 83,000 people there in the stadium or the people around the world or we haven't been to the World Cup for 32 years. I was like, you're taking Australia to the World Cup now, you know. Just do what you have to do. You know where to laugh or cry, because we'd just made the World Cup. I just stood there for a split and had a look around while everyone else was running around, and it was fantastic just to see the whole crowd cheering us, because it wasn't just us that won, it was Australia that got us through to the uh, World Cup. For me, the finest moment in Australian so soccer uh, history for me, and now we're through the World Cup and we're playing Brazil. I mean, what I'd give to, to pull that jersey on and play against Brazil for, for my country, right? If I did that, I could die tomorrow. Happy man. I think everyone was fulfilling a lifelong dream of qualifying for a World Cup, and that's what I did. The 2006 World Cup finally made household names of Australia's soccer stars. For so long, the poor cousins of Australian sport, newspapers, TV, sponsors, line up to associate with the Qantas soccer route. After years, decades and obscurity, Australia has new sporting heroes. In backyards and parks, kids dream of scoring goals, just like Mark Bresciano and John Aloisi. I still believe that there's a lot out there for me to achieve and to achieve that, you've got to be in a big club. And in a big club, you get good opportunities to play in all competitions. And when you're playing in competitions, that's when you, go, uh, you have a chance to win uh, medals. Would you believe it? 
Mexico, a footballer needs more than talent. He also needs more than dedication and commitment. He needs all of that all of the time. Otherwise, he's out of there. And it's Tim Cahill. In, in our Australian team, a, we're more a family than, than, than the team of individuals who played in the Premier League and Serie A. It's a team of uh, players who want to play for each other and, and not for themselves. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great uh, example of, of uh, how football should be. Today, over 150 Australians, enough to field 10 teams in Australia's A-League, play professional football in Europe. And for every Harry Kewell, there are 10 nobodies. Many play in obscurity. Names you've never heard of, and maybe never will. But dreamers will always dream. But young players still want to test themselves against the best. Australia always wants to take on the world. For Australian soccer, the main game, the big game, the match of a lifetime, will continue to be the away game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>